Uh, welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Davani. Uh, this is a new series. I uh, want to start with a tip uh, on a, uh, well, I intend to do this on a regular basis tip. First of all, thank you so much again for, for your time coming on my show. Thank you for having me, Kevin. I'm glad to, uh, to participate in that. Yeah, tip. It's great uh, talk to you because you have a really, you know, a broad uh, perspective, holistic uh, knowledge on a lot of aspects of Bitcoin, what's going on. And um, again, you are, um, let me just for the uh, for any listeners, uh, you are um, at um, uh, Nux custody, right? Is that? Yeah, that's right. Nux, exactly. a Bitcoin custodian. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is like on a regular basis, I'm going to try like to do this like every week or every second week, you know, uh, to do sort of a recap, a recapitulation of, of everything that's been going on uh, within a week or two, uh, you know, substantial, like uh, really important uh, events or, or uh, happenings in the Bitcoin space or, in, you know, in the environment of, of Bitcoin. So what I want to start off is because I find it pretty hilarious um, is an article uh, which is uh, on zerohedge.com. The title is called Peak Irony, Fed Paper Admits Fed Policy Can Lead to Economic Ruin. And I find it pretty hilarious because it's coming now from all sides. They now to have, have to admit themselves that the that the Fed's own policy could lead to economic ruin. Oh, really? So, so, um, so they are, you know, using all kinds, and they've been, you know, criticized from every from every uh, direction you can you can imagine. Uh, you know, using euphemism for quantitative easing. You know, whatever that is, buying up more bonds or treasuries, and you know, uh, pumping up the balance sheet. Uh, uh, you know, there's all kinds of, I think there's somebody on, on Twitter where they list all these euphemism, this, this you know, <laughs> sort of circumvention of, uh, of quantitative easing. And then um, and it says here, we've seen this song and dance before the Federal Reserve ran three rounds of quantitative easing in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, blah, blah. And Walla and Frere, Frere King, I think they may, might be the authors, assure us everything will be fine here in the U.S. Uh, or I don't know who they're quoting. We don't have to worry about hyperinflation because we have an independent central bank. So right. this travesty, I don't know what to call it, this, this clown theater puppet show, what, what, what do you make of this? Yeah, uh, where to start? This is a this is a broad one. I mean, the, the Federal Reserve uh, is a great marketing agency. Mm -hmm. um, sure, they found they will find different ways to um, explain what they're doing, which is basically you know printing money, which is um, a institutionalized um, you know theft from currency holders um, and counterfeiting, right? right. Uh, but taking a step back from this, like it's, I was just like browsing the web last time looking at what the Federal Reserve was and what its history was. And um, quick note, the Federal Reserve has nothing federal and <laughs> doesn't have reserves. Finally, yeah, somebody said it. <laughs> And so that, that's funny, right? Because uh, it is a for-profit corporation with shareholders. Um, the government of the United States is part of that cap table, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, I think, sure, it's a majority shareholders, perhaps 15 or 20%. Uh, don't quote me on this, but it, I think it's along those lines. And the rest is made of other uh, shareholders that we don't, really know who they are uh, and that you can also verify that on wiki from wikipedia or other other sources online and so so it has nothing to do with you know it's not federal it's not government backed per se uh partially only and then in terms of reserves well you know we both know that uh, the united states uh, uh currency the dollar uh, isn't backed by anything um so 
yeah, I just find that interesting. Now, in terms of the, the recent activity of the Fed, um, and specifically, you know, the trigger that was caused um, by the spike uh, of interest in the overnight uh, lending market uh, was quite shocking um, to many insiders um, in Wall Street and in the markets. But if you look at broader mainstream media, not a lot of people talk about this. Um, it's been quite on the, kept on, on the down low uh, thus far. And um, who knows what will, will happen out of it. Uh, markets can stay irrational for a long time. You know, we're seeing now um, asset prices are at all time high. Trump bragging about, you know, the stock market uh, hitting the all time highs. Um, and the reality is people who just read the headlines and that is unfortunately most people um, will see it as a good thing because they treat growth as a net positive, but they don't take into account all the misallocation of capital, all the malinvestments that are brought by, by easy money, by money printing, by liquidity injection, by quantitative easing, call it, call it what you want. It's the same thing, right? Um, and um, one figure that particularly shocked me uh, in those recent um, financial markets um, you know, activities is um, the, the corporate debt market that has been really spiking recently. Mm -hmm. um, I think over the, the, the last figures I had was from January of this year um, to this September. Uh, I don't have the latest figures, but it basically this, the total market cap of corporate debt that is negative yielding um, roughly 50 X. Uh, and so meaning that you have a lot of companies that are borrowing money uh, and they're paid to do so. And what they've been doing recently um, is they basically do what is called share buybacks. Exactly. So using that yeah. Very cheap debt. <laughs> yeah. On a massive scale. On a massive <laughs> on a scale. Massive scale. Uh, and then, you know, people are surprised that, you know, a market valuation of companies, you know, go into the, tr what, yeah, all, nearly like a tri trillion. I mean, this is what yeah. Apple has been doing all, 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 all right. the way along, right? And the reality, you cannot blame these companies. Of course. If you not. think about it, like these companies, like they have a mandate, which is they got to make money and they got to make money in real terms. So they have to constantly be distracted by they're debasing in like inflationary currencies. Uh, so if you're, you know, an American company, it's okay, but still. And so that's why all these companies do all these weird things. And that, that's why they have internal trading desks like Apple, Amazon, and all these companies, they do have trading desks to manage, you know, FX uh, and, and many other things that I'm not even aware of. And so, when you think about it, this is another really good example of, of malinvestment of, of money yeah. because that inflationary currency, they just distract these businesses from, from being able to provide value to their customers. Um, and so anyway, just going back to the share buybacks, you're creating another bubble, right? You have this negative yielding uh, debt that is growing at an alarming rate Mm -hmm. and that is feeding another bubble, which is the one we mentioned, stock, the stock market bubble. So where does it all, when does it all stop? Where does the trigger appear um, to pierce through that bubble? Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea. And yeah. I don't think a lot of people know this. Yeah. And, and let's not forget, there, there was a, a really interesting um, um, report or episode with, uh, you know, tr uh, uh, Stacey Herbert, you know, Max Kaiser, uh, the Kaiser Report right. a while ago, right. like, uh, I don't know, several weeks ago. And they talked about Boeing doing all these share buybacks and, you know, being in this in, uh, sort of under investigation uh, because of the security malfeasance, you know, the, the real the, the, the threat and the, the, the dangers and the, and the um, 
well, the, the lives that have been lost actually because of the security issues uh, and the um, uh, and the uh, consequences of of not allocating enough resources to research development, you know, security updates or whatever, whatever have you, you know, like on engineering uh, side. So uh, because you mentioned share buybacks, you know, so uh, yeah, the, the CEOs, you know, the executives, the, the shareholders, they've been actually profiting, but at the expense of the directly or indirectly at the expense of the security of the Boeing uh, airplanes. So this is this is right. unbelievable, real. So, but because they're so intertwined or interconnected with the military-industrial complex, uh, probably we're not going to see you know much of a like a you know a legal consequence for them because it's hmm. everything is then you know under the name of national security. You can just compartmentalize it and uh, you know uh, put it under the rug, as to say. So I you know I find yeah. this. Fat aspect pretty interesting that uh, you know what is misallocation really mean then you know in the in the in the grander scheme yeah I mean yeah that's a that's a great question the issue I think is the the point you brought which is the intertwined connections between government and for profit entities that are utilizing quote unquote public or common resources um, at the expense of of, of the, the people uh, at the bottom who are who are in cash, for instance, and who are seeing that their their currency being um, diluted and losing purchasing power against um, goods in the economy as the money you know ripples down uh, and the cantillon effect um, appears right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know no, what's so um, funny when you say that? Yeah, you see the the dilution, the inflationary effect, the you know the debasement of money. Uh, this is what they're really good at. You know, it's like you know this uh, this this classical um, uh, proverbial you know example with the, with a frog in the water. You know, where you mm -hmm. warm up the water like gradually, like uh, you know one Celsius after one Celsius, and and eventually, and the water gets and warmer, warmer, and then eventually hot, and and the and the frog just doesn't notice it. And this is where we are. This is the matrix we are born into. But people, because it's so it's so slow, it's because they're so distracted, and it's the process is so slow. They they just they just don't you know they just don't perceive it as <laughs> as being stolen from you know. Right, and to build on that analogy, I believe this uh, you know boiling water is appearing to kill a few frogs in other neighborhood uh, neighbor countries, right? I mean, you look at what's happening in Venezuela, of course, but Argentina would happen in Iran or Turkey or, um, and you sort of start like trying to analyze what mechanism led to this and you realize that look this is the exact same system that we have in the united states in europe and in many other countries in the world it's just a matter of maturity um, these countries are just further down the line of um, you know fractional central banking um, and easy money and so <laughs> at some point you're going to have governments who will abuse um this this power that they have even though you know all these governments claim that central banks are independent entities um you know there's clearly an influence and when central banks conduct what they call open market operations which is essentially a country issuing bonds uh, to finance different programs. Well, the central bank from that country is not only allowed, but will purchase uh, part of that offering of debt. And in order to do that, they will literally print money out of thin air and put that debt on their balance sheet. So, so this is this is what is called like monetization of the debt, right? This exactly, is... right. 
It's crazy. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I mean, it's, and they're pretty open about it now. Um, yeah. So I just wonder what will be the trigger. Now you have, again, Trump barking at the head of the Fed on Twitter, uh, <laughs> saying insane. that they're all assholes, not lowering the interest rates, and that the, the United States should go into negative, uh, in negative, you know, territories. Um, mm -hmm. He's, again, super open about this on Twitter, which I find um, it's phenomenal. What a time to be alive. <laughs> so um this is just insane yeah it's really <laughs> a matrix but anyway um so um let me see what what there are some other couple of other points i wanted to bring uh, yeah you brought up this question uh, yeah at, when you explained like uh, the like how long this this could go on you know uh, it's really yeah you we can't we can't predict but it's really interesting like to think about how how long the system or you know the central banks uh, inclusion with the governments can 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 procrastinate you know uh, uh, um, you know f fueling up this bubble like like how 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 far can you go into this bubble i mean when it's going to when yeah when is the the point where it's going to burst this is a really good question um, and i'm sure they can for you know some time maybe even for you know for years uh, for 10 years uh, yeah it's There's hard a, yeah exactly it's hard right because fiat as a monetary system is an experiment uh i like to bring this this very simple fact of life which is that the euro as a currency and i'm french so i, I i've been through the the change from like the franc to the euro i remember that pretty well and this currency, the euro, and you're a part of it as well, um, is only 17 years old. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's <laughs> it's a real experiment. Oh my god! Bitcoin is 11 years old. Yeah, and look where we are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so look where we are. There's there's not a big difference in terms of like a system that is time tested, and I would argue that. Of course, Bitcoin is much more robust and anti-fragile as a, as a monetary system than the euro is uh, because the euro is, you know, of course, like politically exposed. And, and anyway, there's a lot of other economic activity that, that will influence how the currency uh, price fluctuates. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that overall, fiat currency is, a, is an experiment. And so particularly post 08 the, the quantitative easing and um you look at there are a lot of uh, great resources out there from you know crypto voices um matthew majinski and, and fernando uh, are doing exactly. phenomenal work on that yeah. um mr cool bp ben prentice shout out to this guy uh, he's done, uh, you know, what the fuck happened in 1971 and also has a lot of really interesting data mm -hmm. regarding uh, the expansion of monetary base layers. Um, and yeah, you, you just realize how influential that that is on all economic activity, the debasement of, of currencies. And so yeah, we don't really know when that experiment will, will end, but it looks like there are early signals or even advanced um, signs in other economies of the world that this system is, is failing um, and that it's just, you know, broadening, widening the wealth gap um, as, again, the, the cantillon effect sort of um, goes full blast. Uh, pumping asset prices where capital owners are actually exposed and then just diluting the currency uh, and its purchasing power where all the you know paycheck to paycheck people uh, who don't have assets are and so you're just broadening inequality in a given economy and that that is bad for many reasons. It's unfair. 
because the cost is socialized to the bottom layer of the population and it's the benefits are concentrated and extracted upward in that pyramid where only the rich can access that upside. Right. Um, and if we want to speculate a little bit on how that system could break down, break in, in the United States or in Europe, uh, I mean, there are many avenues, uh, many candidate scenarios, um, mm -hmm. one of which I find really interesting and timely is the um, pension fund market. Um, for instance, my parents are going to retire in the next five years because they're, you know, they're the boomers. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people are about to retire in the next five years to 10 yeah. years, yeah. a lot. <laughs> in Europe in particular, but the United States. And so, you know, we often talk about external debt of countries, you know, the sovereign debt uh, figures that we always refer to. And so for instance, in the US, it's $22 trillion, which is roughly 104% of GDP, which is insane, right? But that is only external. There's internal debt also called unfunded liability. And that is much bigger. Yeah. And in the United States, for instance, it's roughly $200 trillion. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. And this unfunded liabilities is another uh, word to say, and it encapsulates other things, but it's mostly pension. So basically, the United States owing money to people who are about to retire yeah. or who yeah. are retired and are looking to get, you know, the money back under the form of a, of a monthly stipend. Uh, and this money that they've sort of contributed to their 401ks or, or pension uh, programs every month that they've been working in the United States. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the reality is, these unfunded liabilities because they're so large and I don't have the, the, the figures in Europe, but I, I'll look into it because it's interesting. Um, basically, A, today, if things were to, you know, stay as what they are, governments are insolvent. Yeah. Like if you were to treat them as rational economic actors who need to manage cash flow like a business they're insolvent yeah but and the, the banks too is, i mean the banks are insolvent too look at germany i mean they're going to crash right. it's, it's oh right right you look at the yeah, the deutsche bank is like <laughs> insane stuff going on there um yeah. i suspect they're they are the bank that made the repo market rate pump uh but who knows mm -hmm. uh that's another speculative opinion of you mine know. uh and, and, what, and let me let me add, you know, again, you know, the uh, global uh, debt, uh, like if you calculate all the unfunded liabilities, that's why you get this, ins, you know, this, this crazy number of 1.8 to up to two quadrillion uh, uh, US dollars. Because if you add, you know, derivatives, unfunded liabilities to the global <laughs> debt, this is you know, unimaginable yeah, I and mean, people can't even yeah, grasp that. You know? Unfathomable. I was going to say, how many zeros is that? <laughs> oh. Uh, is it 15 zeros? I it's don't know. Like it's six, a lot of zeros. Yeah. Um, but just finishing my, sorry, my stream of consciousness for, for that uh, unfunded liability. Um, the problem is it's not going to go down because mm -hmm. you have negative interest rates and particularly in, in, in the bond market whether it's like we said, corporate debt or, or sovereign debt, which is sovereign debt, I think it's roughly 18 trillion now uh, and corporate is around 1 trillion. Mm -hmm. But, and that figures, you know, they've been, they've been growing over time. And anyway, the managers that are responsible to, you know, make the right capital allocations for these pension funds, because they're basically collecting money from taxpayers, right, in, in the form of income tax every month, 
in the US, in Europe, in any country. And these fiduciaries are supposed to meet return targets. And I think for pension funds, it's roughly 7% um, in real or even let's say nominal to be, to be conservative. Mm-hmm. So let's say, you know, 5% real. Well, the reality is uh, part of their mandate because they are supposed to invest in long term horizons. Mm-hmm. Uh, their mandate requires them to have an allocation, a material allocation to bonds and debt, right? right. With long maturity cycles. And the reality is these, these instruments today uh, of long maturity cycles are yielding negative interest rates. And so all of a sudden you have these, these massive funds that by mandate are allocated to these bond positions and that are yielding negative interest rates and so what do you do now as a as a fund manager who's you know got a fiduciary duty to bring that return you gotta think of other alternatives and also if those bonds are lowering further down their interest rates at some point the uh, classification of those of those instruments will go down. They'll get downgraded. Uh, and if you move, uh, I think the limit is is triple B. If you move in that zone, mm-hmm. you're not a invest investment grade product anymore. And that is a particular threshold which prevents those fiduciaries from holding positions in those assets. Right. And if that happens, then what happens? Well, you got to sell and that sell pressure is just going to basically trigger a massive amount of, uh, of, uh, of divesting from these assets and therefore, you know, cutting the demand and therefore, you know, price go down and, and, and all of a sudden you have, you have, yeah, a system that that's collapsing. Um, I don't know. That's my, that's a, it's a bit of a complex avenue to explore and I haven't sort of built all the, the mental models to make sense of it, but I think it's a, it's a very, very, it's a very interesting avenue and, and, and very scary also. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you, you gave a pretty good overview. Um, thanks so much. Um, so I have a couple of other points I've written down. Um, we don't have to cover all of them, but I just want to have maybe, you know, we can, maybe pick uh, some of them. Or, uh, um, I, uh, I had an interview, a really amazing interview with Zia from Iran. Uh, I, you know, because I've never been to Iran since 1979, 1980. <laughs> so wow. uh, it's really, it was really amazing, like getting a deep insight, you know, what's going on. We couldn't talk about some stuff because, you know, he's in Iran. So there are some sensitive right. issues, right. of course, with, you know, stupid regime and, the protests and you know probably you know, I, I i could I, I do look at it a little bit nuanced uh, there's protests and then we got the riots so i think partially it's been instigated you know and but on the other hand there is a dissatisfaction because of you know social economical uh, un, you know pressure because of rising whatever fuel prices and that was the the triggering point so anyway so uh, and i talked about him you know what could be the solution when because it was an internet shutdown, a down to I don't know, it was at the beginning like down to two, three, four percent, like like mm-hmm. like blackout, you know, and mm-hmm. so now it's been rising again. Now you know they've been sort of um, activating the internet again, and but there's a lot of people. He told me like many, many, like probably most people are using VPN, uh, you know, to in order to access the internet, you know, in a sort of a, a uh, uh, censorship resistant private uh, way and I talked to him you know what could be the you know sustainable solution and I you know I, and for me the only way like to circumvent the, all this uh, you know repression and, and oppression and, and censorship and surveillance and what have you is uh, a really mature uh, development in the satellite local mesh network radio frequencies uh, technology, you know, such as um, what is it called? Like, uh, okay, there's Gotenna, there is this guy who right. I talked to, Locha, Locha, uh, uh, don't know the name, uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, 
uh, let me see, lots uh, uh, ten or some. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so um, and then Blockstream. So I think uh, it it's not going to take so much longer. You know, it's not going to take years, but with a little bit more development, a little more resources, investment money from from you know from investors, I think this this could be a viable super like alternative accessing uh uh first of all you know making transactions bitcoin transactions mm -hmm. and sending messages and there is already i want to like a, do a series of of episodes with experts um whether it be richard myers from gotena or uh what's his name um uh, also with Zia and uh, from Iran, and there's this other guy uh, I talked to yesterday. Um, let me see. Let me look it up. Um, he's uh, a, uh, you know a developer in this in this space. Uh, his name is yeah Randy Brito. Randy Brito right. from um, from Locha. Yeah, Locha. It's called Locha. Yeah. So. It's really amazing stuff going on, and um, and I think this could be, you know, uh, uh, an awesome solution to, to the censorship, to the, uh, you know, oppressive tactics that whatever regime government is using, whether it's be in Venezuela or in Iran. So, like, what, what's what's your take on that? I mean, do you think this we are we are you know going towards uh, in like? The, you know, the, the, the point is it's, it's independent of the internet. That's what I'm talking about. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating movement. Um, at the genesis of, of its uh, maturity, mm -hmm. I believe. And, and it's just getting started and it's not going to stop. Um, I mean, I've try to play with um, Gotena and Mesh Network and I'm not, you know, I'm not deeply technical at all, but also just looking at the network. Last time I looked in Montreal, there was 12 uh, different um, Gotenas, which is like, it's a respectable number, but it's far from making this usable in town. Um, but like you say, you know, in Iran where the internet was shut down, down to two, 3% for, I think it was a week long shutdown. Almost, yeah. 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 Probably. Which yeah. is insane. Yeah. Um, for sure. It's, I mean, it's for sure people are going to find ways and, um, it, it really is a humbling reminder of how awesome mankind and humans are. <laughs> yeah yeah uh and how anti-fragile we are uh on the individual uh, level and so you know we talked about this last time i think bitcoin being the economic powerhouse for the rise of the of the sovereign individual mm -hmm. and um global mesh networking is a beautiful illustration of of sovereign individuals taking a stance for their personal liberties mm -hmm. and celebrating um, that at a local scale to fight, you know, government abusing powers and trying to shut down the internet. And so, yeah. and also sanctions I'm and embargoes, you know, a uh, tip, right. you know, like sanctions and embargoes and people are suffering. There are 80 million people in Iran, 80 million, eight zero. And they're also, they have an urgent need. I mean, this is a huge market, you know, just give them like a kit, like an Android smartphone kit with an antenna. And there you go. I mean, you're independent. Oh you're yeah. You know, it's amazing. You, you know, you take Blockstream satellite beaming, you know, blocks from space uh then you use gotena as a last mile delivery system to do business and just like have economic activity happen between individuals um governments cannot interfere with this uh you don't you're removing the sort of isp level 
attack surface uh, because you know we, we all know that ISDs are super concentrated. Mm -hmm. uh, you're sort of like nullifying that all of a sudden and combine that with the lightning network and this new early protocol called WhatsApp that they've mm -hmm. built, which is the censorship resistant open source messaging system on lightning. <laughs> and you can talk to people, um, you know, in a censorship resistant manner privately. Right. Because we both know that lightning is truly underrated for its privacy enhancing properties. And so it's amazing. Uh, it really is the next, perhaps the next wave of the internet, the next wave of infrastructure is going to be um, just mesh based networking. Uh, and whether you're transacting value using Bitcoin and um, Lightning, using Gotenna and Blockstream satellites, or talking to your friends across the world in you know censored regions with WhatsApp and whatnot. Wow. Wow, um, yeah. And combine I it with mean, the radio frequencies, you know, that you cannot right. in any way scramble or because they would shoot themselves in the foot. I talked to someone, you know, they said, he said, uh, the guy said, it's, it's uh, you know, it's impossible. You can even switch a radio frequency because the military, the government, they're using themselves like all kinds of frequencies. So if they, you know, attack or try to scramble, they're actually shooting themselves in the foot, you know, because they're, they're using themselves this infrastructure of uh, whatever frequencies you know, technology. Yeah, I think we're going, uh, we're going into a beautiful world of Mad Max. Uh, and I yeah. can totally see, you know, the cyber, <laughs> cyber truck being part of this. <laughs> it's, it's a breakaway civilization, but for, for the first time, like for really for, you know, huge uh, majority, uh, like a huge portion of, 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 you know, of the Earth's population, I think this is this is where we're heading to because there's no other way. Look at all the uprisings and protests everywhere going on. It's like crazy. Yeah, no, it's uh, what a time to be alive. It's uh, it's amazing um, <laughs> seeing this happen in real time. And of course, there's a lot of pain and suffering in in countries where people are are protesting. Uh, but it's just beautiful to see that. And yeah, and like individual people are are together in that movement and and seeking to break free from the the oppressive behaviors of of nation states. Um, you know, it's it's fascinating to to observe and yeah. um, and I can't wait to see uh, to see more um, more people just uh, yeah set themselves free of of that. Yeah, the speed is incredible. Yeah, which is going. Uh, so, um, as a reminder, not your keys, not your coins. I just wanted to, you know, uh, uh, there was this hack uh, uh, with all these uh, shit coins on on Upbit exchange. Uh, with I mean, who who leaves like uh, what was it like three hundred fifty thousand ETH or whatever? It's uh, fifty million dollars worth on a hot wow. wallet. I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> Uh, um, now there's some, you know, conspiracies and theories, like you know, because of tax and the, the, the allegedly hackers were like, uh, I don't know, it's just stories, you know, trying begging the, the exchange like to to do like a half half sharing of the of the coins because then the, the exchange could then deduct the taxes, uh, like you know, make mm -hmm. sort of a, <laughs> I don't even know whether that's true. So it might might be just a rumor, uh, but whatever it is, you know. Who leaves like so much, uh, you know, fiat worth, uh, whatever coins or shit coins or whatever on an exchange, you know, with it being ETH or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it's an unfortunate reminder of um, of that. Yeah, not your not your keys, not your bitcoins, uh, or not your keys, not your shit coins. It works as well. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Then, I mean, um, it, to me, uh, as a side note, you know, obviously, you know, I work at a company providing custody services, but so it's like, okay, like this guy is, is, is distorting narratives, but actually I, I truly believe that everybody should hold their own keys and, and run their own node. Um, but when you have, for instance, the, 
the case of of, of uh, exchanges um, holding keys, I think this is a this is a an absurd um, behavior that came out of necessity mm-hmm. uh, because exchanges they're supposed to match orders between buyers and sellers between you know um, takers and makers and take a spread between the you know the the bid and, and ask price um, they're not supposed to be doing market making like they're doing they're not supposed to be doing custody of their customers funds they're supposed to get distribution uh, mm-hmm. and so and grow the liquidity of their order book that's pretty much it yeah. and so you have exchanges doing that very few actually i only know of one and it's our neighbor it's bull bitcoin um led by francis pulio and and uh and vincent and all these great guys uh etienne kekski um they're they understood that the risk of of holding keys just doesn't make sense from a business standpoint it basically is only it's a liability as a as an exchange right um because at the end of the day you don't make any money by by doing um custody of your customers funds unless you charge for this but even if you were to charge for this it would be a very small amount of money that you're making uh as opposed to just like the exchange business so yeah, I really hope that either people understand that they should not hold their keys on exchanges because mm-hmm. exchanges are not designed to do this. And the right. teams operating these exchanges, even though they're super well-intentioned, they're busy working on many different things. And custody is, you know, the last sort of, it very important because that's where they hold most of their funds. Uh, but it's just a cost center for them there's no revenue coming out of this. And mm-hmm. so this is where I believe that in the future, you're going to see um, more regulatory uh, position papers, like the ones that was um, shared by the Hong Kong uh, supervising agencies that said that, for instance, exchanges who are custodial in nature or any other custodial entity mm-hmm. managing Bitcoin and I think they included digital assets um, need to have at least 90 to 95 percent of insurance. Like it's a requirement because the counterparty risk is too is that big. Wow. So okay. either you're basically you're going to see these businesses go and seek insurance uh, policies, but the premiums are going to be extremely high because their systems was not this des- were not designed to accommodate. For, for that type of policy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or you're gonna see specialization and, and uh, segregation of functions between custody, between trading, between market making, between all these things. Um, or you're gonna see a third option, which is people are gonna be truly sovereign and they're gonna hold their own keys and they're gonna use CASA or they're gonna use Unchained Capital and uh you know which are acting as part of collaborative custody models uh so you're still sovereign in a way um so i I truly see these these scenarios play out in the future Mm -hmm. and i believe there will all be true and exist um as people in the marketplace uh have just different risk appetites and risk tolerance and so some will want to do collaborative custody some will want to delegate their their uh, keys their business oh yeah keys. there will be a lot of people specialized uh, entities. still you know uh, insisting on on custodial or semi-custodial because you know uh, especially when you know we have you're really dealing with with substantial amounts or people who you know might not be able like old people it doesn't need to be old people but like you know yeah people who are but yeah. Yeah. Again, I think you look at uh, you look at traditional fiduciaries. Mm-hmm. If if you're a fiduciary and you're investing in, so you're managing other people's asset. There's a principal agent relationship to capital. Um, you're not used to doing custody of your assets, 
You know, you're, you're building investment theses, you're executing those theses with the right amount of risk management uh, controls in place to make sure that you're meeting your duty as a fiduciary and custody is not a direct part of this. You gotta do custody right, but you're actually delegating that function of your operations to a trusted third party. Uh, and so that's why you have today these massive custodial banks like BNY Mellon and State Street, they hold in the tens of trillions of dollars worth of, of securities uh, and other assets. Um, wow. And so these managers, the point that I wanted to make is these managers are not used to doing custody, A, and B, particularly when it comes to bearer assets. I mean, mm -hmm. the custody of a bearer asset is extremely risky. Yeah. Who's holding it? Who's responsible for that? In case something goes wrong, what is the internal governance model to sign off on transactions? Do we have rate limits? If so, how much? Like all of these questions like make it extremely hard to deal with, especially if you have the, the responsibility to hold that asset. And so this is why, again, I, I truly, I do not see a future where um, fiduciaries are not going to delegate that function of, of their operations to trust minimized uh, counterparties. Right, right. Um, I want to go a little bit uh, sidetrack uh, to privacy or coin mixing because I heard uh, Samurai, I mean, he's doing really, uh, both of them, Wasabi and Samurai, they're really doing a great job in the, oh, at yeah. least, you know, in the development uh, process, uh, you know, updating and fixing bugs and, you know, adding features, making it maybe even more usable or hopefully or user friendly. Um, but but Samurai, I think what, what really excites me is that the, the mobile version sort of, of, of coin mixing, the sort of by default a mobile uh, uh, pre, uh, you know, pre and post a mixing of coins uh, for the sake of fungibility and privacy will come hopefully in the near future. Now, what would you say, would you, uh, for now, would you, would you recommend to people like before they transfer their Bitcoin from the exchange to their hardware wallet, does it make sense to, you know, uh, you know, uh, transfer it to, you know, uh, summarize Whirlpool, for example, mix it really good and then, like in small portions, uh, finally, you know, and transfer it to uh, to the hardware wallet uh, instead of directly, you know, from exchange to hardware wallet. Right. Um, so I cannot speak for Samurai because I haven't used it. I'm uh, I'm on uh, I'm on iPhone. Um, guilty of that. I still need to to get my Android device set up and and play around with it. But I'm uh, I'm uh, quite a like a, I'm quite used to uh, Wasabi. Okay. And I I would say CoinJoin and mixing in particular is not only desirable for your as a step before storing your bitcoins for long term. It is, it is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. And not only for, you know, the great common um, good of having fungible Bitcoins, uh, it's to protect yourself. And it is not about fiscal evasion, you know, just like breaking the traceability of your coins from a, an address that is linked to a KYC data to an address that isn't, but it's more about security and OPSEC. Because you look at all these exchanges today that are required to hold KYC data on their customers, mm -hmm. uh, and we have to do it as well as a, as a, as a custodian. Um, and then also, you know, additional like anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing like programs. Um, what this does is that it's, it is putting a lot of data storage requirements on entities uh, providing these these functions in the marketplace so exchanges and so exchanges have massive amounts of highly sensitive customer data like mm -hmm. their full name their home address their you know government issued ids and their balance <laughs> and even if the balance is of course separate from the keys if you see if you have that database breached uh, all of a sudden you have 
crazy amount of, of data that is exposed on these clients where I can know that, you know, John Smith has, you know, who's living at this place in Montreal. Has oh my God, this is highly, this is highly, this is a catastrophe. I mean, this is, this is insane. Just the whole KYC, you know, I mean. It's insane. Right. But the, the thing is, unfortunately, as, as businesses operating in that space, particularly exchanges that are touching fiat, they must do this. Otherwise, the, yeah. the directors and officers, you know, in the management, as part of the management team of these companies, basically are, are committing, um, you know, I guess, fraud or, or just not meeting the, the regulatory requirements that are imposed on, on them by the jurisdiction in which their business is registered or operating. And so, uh, yeah, these, these regulations just make no sense. But more than that, they create tremendous amount of risk. And so to go back to coin joins and mixing it, it is to ensure your personal safety, the safety of your family uh, and, and your, you know, your, your wife, your husband, your kid, like just making sure your, your whole, uh, your whole dwelling is secure and, and not exposed to these risks. Uh, yeah. cause unless you're buying non KYC Bitcoins, uh, and this is hard cause even like great products like BISC, there's no liquidity on this for now. I, I tried to, to look into it in Canada, uh, and like the CAD to BTC market trades at a mega premium, and there are perhaps two sellers or three sellers. Um, so, so not the best experience. Uh, so yeah, definitely coin joining is is super desirable and necessary. And you have again, like I'm gonna shill go Bitcoin, but there as an exchange, they're coin joining all their UTXOs before sending them to, to customers addresses. Oh, cool. Excellent. And yeah. Francis made a really interesting um, position on that saying that basically as an exchange in Canada in particular, as a, sorry, as a financial services firm. So an exchange is part of that category. Um, you are required to not leak customer information. If, of course, the customer didn't give you uh, an explicit consent. Right. And so mm -hmm. if you were, he, he made the argument, which is brilliant, that if you're sending Bitcoins to an address of a customer that is KYC, right? Because, you know, you've KYC that customer. And then that customer goes and like sends it to other addresses because he's like, whatever, it's just moving Bitcoins around. Well, you've just leaked data on your customer because all this data is, is publicly accessible via, you know, the Bitcoin's time chain. And so um, you are against Canadian laws. You're not regulatory compliant. And that is why CoinJoin in Canada for exchanges and other businesses managing Bitcoin UTXOs should be required. That is sort of the whole argument. And I find it fascinating. It makes a lot of sense from a confidentiality of, of customer data standpoint. And I hope that, um, you know, we'll see a more formalized um, position by regulators to enforce that, um, that standard with other entities in the space yeah because you look at again like um blockchain analysis companies uh up to a certain point in um the amount of uh of um mixing that happened right the uh, the the anonymity set if it's beyond a certain threshold and i think that threshold is perhaps like i don't know 15 or 20 but again i'm not technical enough to like be to be super strict on that number uh, it is impossible, basically, to to trace back those UTXOs. If post mixing UTXO consolidation is not like executed on, because that's another issue. Is if you've mixed your Bitcoin UTXOs and then you sort of post mix merge those UTXOs together, then you you can expose. Uh, you know, you're you can basically 
make sense of where those UCXOs came from in the first place and, and basically break the, the privacy that comes from, from the previous mixing. Yeah, and because uh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to speak from my own experience because I did a stupid right. thing. Uh, I, I mixed it on, you know, Samurai Whirlpool, and then it, as one like one total amount, I, <laughs> I, I transferred it finally, you know, to my hardware wallet. But that makes the whole coin mixing obsolete. So what what uh, what I was advised to do is like you know like do it like in portions, like like split it up, mm-hmm. split up the amounts because otherwise it doesn't right. make sense to make the whole coin mixing. And the, you know, you make the whole, then they, you know, people can, uh, whatever, uh, you know, uh, uh, criminal people can finally, you know, um, track you down actually, because you've, you've, uh, what do you call it? Like you, um, uh, you've, yeah, you, you, uh, you, you linked sort of everything together again, sort of, right? I mean, the way right. I understand it. Yeah. Right. No, and it's hard. Privacy is really hard. Um, it's we're we're yeah. It's a good reminder that we're still in the uh, very early days of that. And then of course there's you know you need to be careful which wallet you're using. And for instance, if you're using Trezor uh, and you're using their web app, um, well the reality is they say they don't log anything, but they log your IP, uh, and your IP can be tied to your identity. And boom, all of a sudden you know you've leaked uh, all your all your your personal data again right uh, same thing for the xbob um, that treasure uh, may have access to so again it, it's really hard uh, and uh, it really takes uh, you know that extra mile of due diligence anytime you uh, you're about to take an action uh, if you want to stay private using bitcoin excellent yeah 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 um... So I'm going to keep this uh, as short as possible um, so we don't overwhelm my listeners. Um, right. <laughs> the only thing that I was just going to say, you know, for a final is that, you know, in the end, um, uh, we, you know, we should all understand, uh, as Michael Goldstein, I think, said in the um, interview with Peter McCormack, he said, it's not sort of Bitcoin is not the end of it. You know, uh, it's what it's, I quote him, it's because of we of of we believe bitcoin of what we believe bitcoin enables and i found that you know his statement pretty pretty accurate because uh you know it's not per se the bitcoin itself but what we can create you know new structures uh new ecosystems new civilization whatever it is or um, new disclosure of technologies in, in my in my you know from my perspective <laughs> so uh it, what it really enables. This is, uh, I think, a good final thought for for our recap. Um, oh yeah, yeah, our show. very well said. Very, uh, very eloquent and super, super true. Uh, um, it is, um, yeah, it is the the rise of the sovereign individual. You know, exactly. Monetary sovereignty is the ultimate trigger that will liberate people. Um, to do amazing things, um, you know, whether it's um, entrepreneurs being able to make good economic calculation because you have a sound money, or whether it's just being able to use a censorship-resistant way to transfer value or save your wealth over time, preserve your wealth over time. It's, I think the yeah the 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 sky's the limit. The sort of in terms of what Bitcoin will enable in the next uh, decades it's um yeah super blessed to be uh, to be alive right now <laughs> yeah i couldn't agree more yeah no uh, it was beautiful uh tip th- tip thank you so much uh i'll talk to you soon um uh, hopefully in, we can do this on a regular basis and um yeah, thank you so much for sharing your we knowledge man. it was, uh, yeah, it was awesome yeah. thank you kevin thank you so much all right talk soon bye ciao ciao Ciao.